In 1876, Los Angeles became the end of the line of the Transcontinental Railroad. Thousands of men, many displaced veterans of the Civil War, began to ride the rails, stowing away in empty boxcars and jumping trains. These hobos survived by handouts from religious and charitable organizations. The place where they congregated was called Hobo Corner. At the turn of the century, First and Los Angeles Street was legendary. It was one of the toughest hangouts in the West. It became infested with alcoholics, mental illness, and violence. Society deemed these people scum and dirty pigs. These hobos survived by handouts from religious and charitable organizations. Many became alcoholics ending up there. The social services began to evolve into social centers. During World War II and Vietnam, a lot of servicemen ended up there because it became their havens during their journeys. From the 1960s to the 1970s, 22,750 hotel rooms were closed down because they did not meet fire and safety codes. In 1975, the city put all their money into redeveloping this area. Because of this, surrounding communities were underfunded and sent their homeless to Skid Row. In the late 1970s, the EPA started closing down polluting factories. And with that, so went a lot of unskilled jobs. In Los Angeles County, Fire Station 9, which covers Skid Row, is the busiest firehouse in America, responding to 35,518 calls for service last year. There are over 2,500 nomads living on the street there. The term Skid Road derives from Seattle, Washington, where Skid Roads were the places where loggers slid their cut lumber to the ports for shipment. By the 1930s, the term referred to rundown areas of cities, characterized by bars, brothels, and the like originally attracted by loggers and began to include the presence of homeless and other extremely low-income populations. In December of 2017, a federal ban on the making of lethal viruses was lifted. Sometime in late December of 2019, there was a new form of coronavirus discovered in Wuhan, China. We were told it started in a fish market by people eating bats. At first, the Chinese told us not to worry about it. Then Dr. Fossey told us there was nothing to worry about. And then the WHO told everyone not to worry because China said it wasn't contagious. In early January, Bill Gates and Barack Obama released a docu-series called Pandemic on Netflix. In late January, India announced that the coronavirus had at least four protein inserts from HIV, which is a sign of engineering, leading them to believe that it was an engineered bioweapon. At the same time, Charles Lieber, the head of Harvard's Chemistry and Chemical Biology, was arrested for lying about his ties to China Wuhan University of Technology. I suspect he made the virus but others think it was made at the University of North Carolina by grants approved by the Obama administration. At the end of January, President Trump shut down all flights coming from China. Dr. Fossey predicted that 100,000 to 200,000 people in the U.S. would die of it and thought we should never shake hands again. Late in February, one Harvard epidemiologist, Mark Lipsitz, said that 70% of the world's population would get it. Russia closed its borders with China. China went on lockdown and imposed martial law on several major cities, Wuhan being one of them. On April 10th, Dr. Fossey lowered his prediction down to 60,000 and said social distancing was working. He also said we would never shake hands again. He then said that more lives could have been saved if Trump had reacted earlier. This made Trump start a second team of experts rather than firing him. A few days later, an MIT PhD scientist named Dr. Shiva said that Dr. Fossey and Bill Gates want every person on the planet vaccinated by April 13, 2020. On April 15, Trump defunded the WHO, which Gates owns 15% of. On April 17, Dr. Rashid Buttar started releasing videos that said that wearing masks were counterproductive. But he also showed the video of Dr. Fossey predicting in January 2017 that there would be a surprise outbreak during the Trump presidency. In October 2019, Bill Gates sponsored event 201. It was a simulation that showed 65 million killed by the coronavirus. People were being arrested for not wearing face masks. He explained how social distancing was absurd. He said he could get rid of the virus within 24 hours. On April 20th, hackers hacked into the WHO, Bill Gates, and the lab in Wuhan. They discovered that Dr. Fossey was funding the lab as well as Gates. On May 8th, the president of Tanzania tested the coronavirus test on a goat, a quarry bird, and a papaw fruit, and they came out positive. 
On May 18th, Trump started taking hydrochloroquine. It's a well-known cure that's cheap and it's been out there for decades. If a patient has COVID-19, the hospital gets $5,000. If the patient has pneumonia, they get $13,000. If they end up on a ventilator, they get $39,000. Because of this, hospitals in New York City were falsifying information. The mayor was demanding that they use ventilators, but in almost every case, the patients died. He also started sticking seniors infected with the virus into senior homes, infecting and killing thousands. They were also ordered not to revive heart patients and people with Alzheimer's. There's an amazing correlation between 5G cell towers and the areas that were hardest hit. Then around May 28th, Italian doctors disobeyed the WHO and did autopsies. They discovered that it was a bacterium and together with 5G produces inflammation and hypoxia. Once they discovered this, they gave their patients aspirin and a Pronox. They sent 14,000 patients home in a single day. The WHO finally admitted that the spread of COVID-19 by asymptomatic carriers was rare. At the same time, the CDC said that the death rate was 0.4%. Yet those who have weak immune systems will fall as victims. We plan to do our best to help the nomads in Skid Row and elsewhere. My name is Kevin Davis. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. When I was five, I would go to church and learn the song called Jesus Loves the Little Children. The song talked about how Jesus loved all kids of all races. Then I would go into a mall and see a separate water fountain for blacks only. I was pretty confused. When I was six, I was sent away to live with my grandparents in a small farming community in Nebraska. There were no minorities there. When I was nine, my mom remarried and I moved back with my family to Southgate, California. Our new stepfather was a racist and a bigot. We lived in Alameda Street. On the other side of the tracks was Watts. When I was 12, we moved a few blocks away to a neighborhood that was infested with drugs. And of course, this influenced me. I was the only Boy Scout in my neighborhood and almost an Eagle Scout. There were no blacks in grammar school. I was the president of the school when I was in sixth grade. When I got to junior high and high school, there was a third black, a third Hispanic, and a third white. For the most part, these groups remained separated. I went to college to study theater. I found this was a group of misfits and people that didn't belong. I studied lighting and scenery design. In 1983, I lived downtown in LA for several months. The homeless population wasn't that bad and we had a lot of homeless friends. In 1984, I started my first scenery and special effects shop. In four years, it grew to be one of the largest on the West Coast. Right before the union took me out, I was worth two and a half million dollars. It was a godsend because I had so much business, I was working 20 hours a day, seven days a week. To make this happen, I used cocaine. Had I continued this pace, I would have died of a heart attack. I stopped cocaine and then started a smaller shop downtown LA. One of my clients was working for the Super Bowl in Pasadena, and the NFL said we had to have a minority crew to be able to work on the job. I then put together a group of homeless workers and trained them. Most of these were black. To this day, this was the best crew I ever had. There were homeless people living behind my shop that would guard my shop at night. For a brief period of my career, I was the only white person that was working for BET, Black Entertainment Television. I was an art director and donated my time for such causes as Coalition for Free Africa, produced by Dick Griffey. In 1992, after the Rodney King riots, there was a movement to come up with an idea how to rebuild LA. My friend John Marshall and a few other black leaders came up with an idea to build a film school near USC for minorities. This became such a great idea that Vice President Gore was going to take a bus tour through South LA with John as well as a few prominent black speakers. And then Maxine Waters claimed it was her idea. She parked a lady answering a phone in an office. The White House seen this as a turmoil, abandoned the idea, and gave the money to the Missouri flood victims. In 1996, the director of the CIA came to a high school in LA for a town meeting. At that meeting, Michael Rupert, an ex-LAPD narcotics officer, confronted Don Juche and told him that he'd seen the CIA's involvement in drug dealing in South LA. They were bringing crack cocaine into South LA and selling it at dirt cheap prices. Gary Webb picked up on this story and wrote about it in the Mercury News. Then Maxine Waters took her story to Congress. For Gary's involvement, he was whacked in the late 2004. In 2006, Michael moved to Venezuela fearing for his life. He then came back several years before he took his own life. He told everybody he was with a friend in Colorado, but he secretly was living with a friend in Calistoga, California. I was friends with Michael about a year before he took his life. He was pissed that Maxine Waters had taken his story to Congress and left him and Gary out to dry. He had been stripped of all his benefits from the LAPD and was living on the charity of friends. He was afraid for his friend's life. Three days before he shot himself in the head, he told us all what he was going to do. 
Not one of us tried to stop him. On April 13, 2014, Michael did the decent thing. I will never forget this hero. In early 2001, my girlfriend produced a radio show for Ted Hayes, the downtown L.A. homeless activist who built the Dome Village. The Dome Village consisted of 20 fiberglass domes where families could live. The money was donated by ARCO. The radio show we did was in Pasadena and very late at night. Only a few people from Dome Village would call in. I sat in a booth next to Ted and called in, disguising my voice in different accents. I asked vague questions so Ted could explain what was going on. At the time, Ted lived in Hollywood and had several girlfriends. His problem was that he was a Republican and thought George Bush Jr. would help him out. Ted said there were 12 NGOs that were downtown L.A. to help, and none of them were doing anything. In 2006, the property they were renting increased by 700%. L.A. had a chance at homelessness, but sold out to developers who made million-dollar loss. In 2002, I met a teacher of spiritual teachers like Deepak Chopra and Michael Beckworth. Her name was Pamelia Evans. She used the term divine nomad to describe the homeless, and it stuck. In 2009, I went to the Amazon to help restore it and save lives. I cleaned a major stream in the city of Bacalpa, Peru, and pulled out over 3,700 bags of trash. I fed nearly 1,200 kids and took about 100 to hospitals. I had a massive plan that I put together, and then in 2015, I had a brain aneurysm. While I was doing this, people kept asking me why I wasn't helping my own. When I first started going there, the homeless wasn't that big of an issue. Now it is. The reason I bring up my relationship with the black community is because about 70% of the nomads in Skid Row are black. And as we have heard, somewhere between 80 to 90% of Skid Row nomads are addicts. But let's explore the reasons why. Some are crazy, and the ACLU is blocking friends and families from having them committed. They say half the nomads suffer from head trauma. Just lazy. There's not much society can do for these people rather than use positive reinforcement to show them how to get ahead. People with PTSD. What services are out there to help these people? The military is just starting to address this situation, but not all PTSD is war-related. People that have given up on society and responsibility. Maybe they just need time or someone to give them a break. Hobos who just want to roam the earth with no obligations and very few responsibilities. Gamblers that have lost everything. This is just another form of addiction, yet there are no people to really help them. Running away from domestic violence. Running away from street violence. People that have lost everything in disasters, both natural and man-made. On the streets because of social rejection. People have lost their jobs. People who are on the run from the law. Illegals that are in hiding. Handicapped and have physical disabilities. Ex-cons who just got out of prison and have no one to help them. People running away from family conflicts. People with financial difficulties. We are not here to judge. We are only here to help. Everyone has different stories. Most of them are full of pain. I believe as a society we are here to help everyone find their purpose for being here. As Ram Dass said, we are all here to walk each other home. It is now getting dangerous to go to Skid Row. Besides releasing prisoners, we are now having riots and we don't see them going away. We have also outgrown the car. We are in need of a step ban like the one in the picture. We are not an NGO. If we were, a large percentage of donations would go towards accounting and other overhead. 100% of your donations go directly to the cause. Maybe some of you would like to do this in your community. I would like to share with you our cost. We go to five stores. The first is Costco. There we buy quality socks for about $1.50 a pair. We also get our tortillas there and spend about 25 cents per tortilla. We get onions and tomatoes there. We pay 3 cents per burrito in tomatoes and 4 cents in onions. Our rice is about 1 cent and the vitamin D3 is 12 cents for a week's worth. Finally, we get our water there for about 8 cents a bottle. We buy our mini Ziploc bags for the vitamins at 4 cents and we get them at a local tobacco store. At Smart and Final, we get aluminum sheets at 8 cents per. We also buy brown bags for 5 cents. 
We've discovered probiotic blueberry scones from a company called Topanga Grain Company. Let me explain their process. All of their bread, including their biscuits, are whole grain sourdough using only organic plant-based ingredients. They stone mill their organic grain right before mixing and baking. Stone milling means they are using the whole seed which provides proteins, vitamin B, fiber, enzymes, and natural oils from the seed in their bread. All of their bread is fermented in what is known as the European style long fermentation over three days. This gives the beneficial bacteria in the sourdough a chance to pre-digest and break down the gluten before baking resulting in zero inflammation. This makes their bread good for the body as well as delicious. Long fermented sourdough is what they like to call natural gluten free bread. It is the way we are intended to eat bread. Their biscuits are southern style comfort food that you don't have to feel guilty about. They make everything from scratch and they are family owned. We pay about 50 cents a slice. The cost of a pair of socks are $1.50. Our burrito is 58 cents. Water is 8 cents. A week's worth of vitamin D3 is 21 cents. A slice of a blueberry sourdough scone is 50 cents. A bag is 5 cents. The total cost is $2.92. California has 300,000 nomads. Three nomads die every day in LA County alone. As a society, shouldn't we be responsible for the downtrodden? In the car we use right now, we can only help about 150 nomads. Yet there are at least 2,500 nomads in Skid Row. Right now, our governor is releasing prisoners and closing down juvenile detention centers. The mayor of LA is closing down the men's central jail. At the same time, LA is defunding the police. It's another reason why we need to buy a step van. Dick Gregory once said that when we die, we go in front of the big man and he asks one question. What did you do for your fellow man? Helping one person may not change the world, but it can change that person's world.